Namaste, everybody, and a warm welcome to you. Uh, this is Nishit Kotak. I'm here with the team from Hindu Academy. Welcome to the broadcast. And if you are new to the broadcast, uh, I'll just quickly explain to you the format of this broadcast and what it is that we do. We meet every Saturday at two o'clock uh, UK time, and this broadcast runs for about 50 to 60 minutes. The format is very simple. We discuss things to do with Hinduism. Uh, so if you have any questions, thoughts, or comment about Hinduism, please do pop them into the comments or the chat area on whatever platform you're watching us today from. You can get us live on youtube.com forward slash Hindu Academy. You can also watch us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Hindu Academy. Apart from this, we are also streaming on Twitter where you can follow us on twitter.com forward slash Hindu Academy. Now, uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, sharing with you a focus topic video. This week, we are going to have a really interesting one. It's to do with, you know, the, 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 the nearest festival we've got right now going on is the Ganesh Chaturthi. And we're going to be talking about um, Ganesh and whether, you know, um, generally, if we're going to talk about Hindu deities, are they real? So we're going to have a quick uh, video on this. And then we're going to come back and discuss about the Ganesh Chaturthi. So bear with me a moment as I share my screen and share the little video we've got for you. Hindu gods like Ganesh, Shiv really exist or are they just symbolic? Because a PhD Buddhist monk once told me that if they really exist, um, and sorry, a Buddhist monk told me that they really exist, and I was wondering if the same applies okay. within Hinduism. Is that the same belief? No, it's good to always ask that pointed question. Think about all these things in a very clear manner. Be clear thinkers, always I tell, tell you. Okay, do they exist or don't they exist? Let me tell you. If you really, for example, has any any you know devotee ever seen Ganesh with elephant tusk and everything? I have not come across a single devotee, uh, in a bhakta in the Hindu tradition who says, oh, yes, I have seen Ganesh with a trunk and all that. See, straight away. So what is going on? You see, we have to recognize that in a way we project the idea of God depending on our own temperament. So at some stage we got caught up with this idea of elephant-headed God and it's become iconic, a symbolic thing, but it has become very much embedded in the way we think and the way we pray, etc. So it has become very much part of our tradition, so we recognize it for what it is. Don't try and give it literal truth, otherwise you are in big trouble. So you say, but Mr. Lakhani, uh, does Shiva exist? I mean, okay, you say Ganesh with elephant head seems a bit tricky. What about Shiva or, or etc.? This is the answer. Think about it very carefully. If you really love Shiva, I'm telling you, if you really love Shiva, you have tremendous attraction for this personality called Shiva. It, once you have this tremendous attraction for Shiva, then that particular attraction, you are, if you like, the spark of divine. You have infinite power yourself. So when you have this tremendous you know, attraction to the image of Shiva, or the, the symbol of Shiva, what will happen is this. You will create Shiva in the image that you want to see him. So it is not such make-believe. You, in a way, project the idea of God in the way that you, you it suits your own temperament, and that God will, that particular symbolism will become real for you. And this Shiva, who appears just like a symbolic, uh, symbolic gesture, will become Shiva and come and stand in front of you and interact with you more intensely than me interacting with you now. How do I know all these things? Look, my mentor Sri Ramakrishna said, I want to see God as a mother goddess. Now, very few bhaktas have seen the goddess and mother goddess. And he guy, I want to see mother goddess. He literally spent eight years worshipping and devout, you know, devo devoting his time to worshipping mother goddess. And actually, at the end of it, mother goddess came in front of him in a very dynamic manner, very real manner. And when Vivekananda asked him, have you seen God? He said, yes, I can see God more clearly than I can see you, more vibrantly. So, in a way, we project the mold. And this thing that we call the spirit, this uh, the, this thing we call Brahman, takes on the, the you know fills up that mold and takes on a hum, and the, on, takes on that form and comes and plays with us. 
So it is true that if you are devout to the idea, say, let's say I want to think of God as Ganesha, whatever, it will take on that form and come in front of you. But I have not come across any, any Bhakta in the past who has seen Ganesha in that particular manner. But you can, you see, you are allowed to project the idea of God that suits your own temperament and that particular mold will get filled up by Brahman and become, come alive and come in front of, in front of you and play with you. Where is my proof? Ram Krishna. So there you go. We have a really interesting topic to go. And with Ganesh Chaturthi, which was just recently celebrated a couple of days back, it is one of the most loved festivals in the Hindu calendar. And, uh, you know, we say Ganesh is revered as the remover of obstacles. We usually pray to Ganesh before we do any other kind of uh, puja or any other kind of uh, positive thing in life. And he is frequently uh, one of the first statues at the mandirs as well and so on. There's a lot to sort of um, uh, investigate and digest and enjoy about this particular uh, personality in, the Hin in Hinduism. And to take this conversation forward, I'd like to invite Manish Pai. So today we got the full team in house. We got Manish Pai, Sita uh, Ben and Vijay Bhai. Welcome to today's call everybody. And Manish Pai, over to you. Namaste viewers, thank you for joining us today. A very interesting topic today. Uh, Ganesh uh, festival going on uh, throughout the world and uh, Ganesh devotees, uh, you know, big thing, very big thing in India uh, where it's a 10 day festival started on 31st August and, uh, you know, people bring uh, huge murtis of, uh, uh, Ganesh uh, Ganapati to their streets and there is a like street uh, uh, pujas happening every day and uh, on the 10th day which will be 9th September in this case the Ganesh Visarjan happens. So uh, Vijay Bhai what is the story behind Ganesh festival and uh, how did this come about? So yeah, so the Ganesh festival is quite amazing. Um, I was very lucky actually. I've actually been to Mumbai once on Ganesh Chaturthi. And it's absolutely amazing. The amount of, you know, spirituality flowing, everybody celebrating Ganesh Chaturthi is amazing. So it's basically celebrating the birth of Ganesh. Um, and I know everybody knows the story of Ganesh, you know, the battle with, with the Ganas of Shiva and then, you know, him defending his mother's honor, all that story comes into play. But so, so in that sense, that's the story of Ganesh. It's basically his birth. But the celebrate is really amazing. I mean, I think 10 days before, uh, they actually make, uh, you know, a, a special uh, um, image of Ganesh, maybe of clay, make a special um, uh, kind of, you know, mandal, uh, mandap in a um, raised platform, put him there, and they do special worship for 10 days. And then all kinds of, you know, penances. Some people do fasting. Uh, some people do mantras, jumps, all that stuff. And basically, you want to pray Ganesh and you worship him because you love him. I mean, he's very lovable, uh, God. If you look at him, he's so amazing the way he looks, very cute as well. But also the idea that you want him to also give you good luck, auspiciousness. So he takes for, takes this for 10 days. And on the 10th day, of course, you see that um, the Vishajan takes place. So the whole idea is to imbibe spirit, spirituality into us. So, of course, Ganesh is very popular in some parts of it, like Maharashtra, is, especially Maharashtra. But this time I was looking at a um, lot of news and all over India, even South India, you know, you know uh, even Bengal state is famous for Madurga, Gujarat state, even the temples, our own temple, Swamiyan temple, they were really into it and they're really celebrating Ganesh Chaturthi. So it's, it's actually spreading more and more, it's spreading and everybody's doing it. I think it's a wonderful thing. So regarding that's the idea of Ganesh Chaturthi. Um, that's what I can add to that idea of festival itself, uh, Manish Bhai. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, Vijay Bhai's covered it amazingly. So, I mean, Ganesh is very special um, for all Hindus, especially because any sort of new endeavor that you begin, you turn to Ganesh Festival. So any kind of wedding, any kind of start of a new business and you buying a new house, buying or doing something life changing. 
Hindus always turn to Ganesh first because he seems to be the one who, who removes obstacles. And the beautiful thing about Hindus that, and, you know, the way they practice their religion is they kind of divinify everything they do. Because, you know, if you're an atheist or a secular person, like you don't have it, you just, you just go about your day-to-day -day business. You don't do any kind of pausing and thinking in terms of anything higher, a more spiritual aspect to life. But within Hinduism, it's really deeply encouraged whenever you buy a new house, a new motorbike, a new car, whatever it is, you want to do worship, you want to sort of be thankful to, to God um, for what you have received. And also, it's a way of remembering God at an auspicious time to kind of make sure that things go in the right way and you kind of pray for that sort of strength um, so make sure everything is done in the correct sort of way and the beautiful thing about Ganesh um, is because he's part of the, the Shiva tradition and the wonderful thing about the Shiva tradition is they really encourage the idea of not just thinking of you and God as being separate, but the idea that you are actually God yourself. Um, this idea of Advait is really free flowing in the Shiva tradition. And it just reminds me of a couple of stories um, about Ganesh. So my dad has told this story billions of times across hundreds of schools, this story of Ganesh and the cat. Um, I won't go into too much depth in it, but it's basically a story of how Ganesh as a child learns how every life form is divine. And if you hurt or harm any living thing, you're actually hurting and harming God. Um, and this is really the basis of ethics and morality um, in Hinduism, because everything is divine. So if you are hurting somebody else, you are actually hurting yourself. Um, and another beautiful story it reminds me of is the story of when Bharati and Shiva are made to sit down by Ganesh and there was a competition of who can go around the whole universe first and uh, Ganesh's brother Kartike zip, zips off to go literally around the whole universe but Ganesh is very clever he says my mother and father Shiva and Parvati are the entire universe. They are the manifestation of God. So I just need to go around them. So he made them sit down three times and go around them. And he had been around the whole universe. Um, so these beautiful ideas of everything being divine is really prominent in the Shiva tradition and with all of the stories that surround Ganesh. Yes, that's uh, wonderful stories, and uh, Jay Bai have told those uh, stories very nicely. We have videos on them. Please do check them out on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, so one thing um, Jay Bai mentioned in that video is uh, you don't come across someone who has actually experienced Ganesh. Now, that's a bit worrying, isn't it? I mean, is it? not easy to experience Ganes. What's going on there, uh, Sita Bin? I think, um, I mean, it's, it's very possible because if you look at the history of humanity and the number of people who have prayed to all of these deities, um, it's not necessarily true that every single person who has experienced God in a personalized way like this will declare it to the whole world. They won't tell the whole planet, I have seen God in this particular way. So it, it's very possible that people have actually seen and experienced personalities like Ganesh and Shiva and Mother Goddess and not blown a trumpet about it. They may have quietly had that experience in a very personal way and they don't go and shout about it to the rest of the world. So how do we know? Um, we're lucky that we've got a lot of saints and prophets in India, such as Mirabai and Dulsidas and so many. Um, and they all talk about seeing God as Krishna and Ram. And, you know, we are used to those kinds of um, experiences and hearing how they sort of, you know, recount that spiritual experience. But it's true. Um, you haven't come across many who sort of say, I have seen God as Ganesh or I have seen God as Mother Goddess or as... <laughs> So it's one of those things, perhaps those personalities um, who have experienced God in that way, they don't want to make a fuss about it. Maybe they just quietly have that experience. And how do we know? They might be our next door neighbor. How do we know? So it's one of those things. It's very subjective, a very personal experience to have that vision of the deity that you love. And it depends on your personality, how you want to share it or not share it, I guess. Uh, Vijay Bhai? Yeah, I think one thing to as Sita, I really agree with you that you can never say because everybody's experiences are different and how they share is really onto them. Um, 
I know that, uh, I know in local temple, there are a lot of ladies who say, oh, I had a vision of Lord Swaminar. I said, I had this darshan. I said, okay, very good, you know, for you, because they had a glimpse. So I think one thing that Jai Bhai mentioned in the video, which is really interesting, was the idea that the way you see God is very personalized. Like, you know, I was discussing with somebody about Ganesh Chaturthi, interesting enough, um, a friend of mine who's really into this Ganesh Chaturthi festival. And I asked him, so is Ganesh with 10 heads, one head? Is he dark, light? Is he in dancing form? How do you see? He's got two hands, four hands. So even when you get Ganesh, it's a variation, right? People see Ganesh in different ways. You can see Ganesh with different kind of forms. So it's very, even to see Ganesh himself also is very personalized, how you see him. So in effect, I think it's, the idea is very, as Jay Bai mentioned, the way you uh, kind of what you call, where you limit Brahman to interact can really vary from person to person. I mean, but I agree with Sita that I've seen a lot of people say that I've experienced Krishna on the Vaishnava tradition. Shiva tradition, not so much. Maybe I haven't heard any, but there may be some. Mother goddess, I know some people say, I feel the mother goddess, I, you know, I can vision it. But so, but Vishnu tradition, I know is quite hurry, you know, attracting and everybody saying, I've seen, I felt Krishna like that. Or Mira. I, also in history, Ulsidas, Mirabai, Narsim Mehta, this great, great you know, sage from India. I think in South India, there's something called Purandar Das, Otukudu from Tamil, a great, great sense of India, who have all experienced God firsthand. But um, it's interesting to see this, that uh, as, as Sita mentioned, we divinify everything. And we also limit it in such a form that we can actually interact with it. That's the beauty about it. We, if, it's, if you divinify something, you know, and it's very abstract, it's very hard to interact. Like, you know, good luck, also Ganesh, ah, ah, let's interact with the idea. Or any other force or energy, any good thing, you can actually divinify it in a form, in a God, and interact. And that's the beauty about Hinduism. So, yeah, Ganesh. Bhai. Wonderful answer, Sita Ben uh, Vijay Bhai. Uh, good to hear that. Uh, we got a Santos, uh, who is a 14-year-old, uh, wanting to ask about festivals of Hinduism. He's saying, can I do fasting for these auspicious days? If not, what can I offer? So well, I'm going to expand this question a little bit. And, you know, festivals like Ganesh uh, Festival, 10 days of massive uh, celebrations, street celebrations and pujas. It's like bringing uh, the whole of Sanatan Dharma alive and into the you know public arena. How should people you know approach these days, and how should they get involved and you know really infuse that spirituality in the day to day life? Sita Bhai. Yes, I mean, so the same applies for so many festivals. Um, there are many ways that you can sort of get involved. So there are community events, but you can also do it in a very personalized way. The beauty about Hinduism is that it's not a prescriptive religion. So you can pick and choose and do what suits you the best. So you might you may want to fast, you may not want to fast, you may want to go to the mandir, you may want to catch darshan, catch sight of Ganesh, or whichever deity it is whose festival it is. Um, you may also want to do some good work in the community so it gives you a chance to sort of take a pause from your daily routine and try and do something for others or try and think about something higher maybe you want to meditate or just reflect on the stories of Ganesh and what he represents so it's very very personal to you and what you would like to do and um, we've discussed this previously is that you know in Hinduism, everyone is divine, everything is divine. So why should we have any kind of special days at all if everyone and everything is divine? And the whole point of these festivals is that, you know, because we are human beings, we need these kinds of tools to hang on to, like, oh, there's a festival coming up and it's a chance for me to think about Ganesh or the mother goddess or whoever it is. So it's for our benefit, our human benefit, because life just rushes past us otherwise. So festivals give us a chance to take a pause and take a break and think about something higher. And we can do it in whichever way suits us the best. You may be a very private person. You may not want to go out into the community, but you may be a very extrovert person and you may want to go out and celebrate in the community. So it's totally up to you how you would like to do it. Uh, would you like? No, I absolutely agree, Sita. It is, it's very individualistic how you celebrate. But I think one thing about the idea of festivals is that when people get together and all work together to celebrate something in a spiritual manner, it actually helps each other as well. You know, because when you do it on your own every daily, daily routine, you do it, okay. When everybody is together and you, everybody psychs each other up, okay, let's do this, let's do this. There's a, a different kind of level of you know, spirituality. 
And regarding, I think, apart from all the things that Sita mentioned, I know some people also take some sort of vows and from now on, I will stop doing this. If you're a smoker, I stop, give up smoking. So you take some sort of, you know, how do you change it? How will you change your life in the future? You take all the decisions in life. So there's so many things you can do in festivals. Um, but I think the main thing is that when you celebrate in communal fashion together, it brings out different flavor all together. And that's the beauty about this festival. So yeah, that's what I can add to that, Manish. Wonderful to hear, see, uh, Vijay Vaisi Sitabin. We have a question about uh, birds of Ganesh. Can you tell us more about it? Uh, Vijay Bhai, over to you. Okay, there's this big story about birth of Ganesh. It's a very long, long story. Uh, but the gist of it is that it, at one time, I think that uh, uh, Parvati was in the house and um, she wouldn't want to be disturbed. Yeah, maybe taking a shower or something. She didn't want to be disturbed. And so what happened was she said, how do I make sure nobody disturbs me? She said from her own... Uh, body sweat or, you know, on whatever she made uh, Ganesh out of that, or some, some people say, or some sort of mud or whatever. And she made Ganesh and said, please guard the door, make sure nobody disturbs me. But of course he didn't know about Shiva. So when Shiva turned up, the Shiva said, I want to go inside. And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm, my mother has given me a command and that's it. I don't really care about anybody else. So it just shows the love that Ganesh had for his mother. Nothing would sway him at all. Not even any kind of excuse, oh, I'm the husband, not, nothing will work for him. <laughs> so then, of course, a lot of battle takes place. He sends Nandi the bull is defeated, everybody defeated. He sends his gunners, you know, and they all get defeated. Until eventually Shiva himself comes there. And the story goes that when Shiva actually uh, got rid of his head, apparently, and then, then Pavati came and she found out. She was very angry and upset. And then, of course, eventually the story was that the uh, first animal was taken and the Ganesh head was put on it. And of course, body was, uh, uh, Ganesh was made alive again. And then the issue came that, well, you know, he doesn't look nice now anymore. He looks really strange. Nobody will worship him. He'll never have a, post, uh, you know, a nice place among the gods. And Shiva said, no, I, I'll make a vow that he will be first one to be worshipped in any kind of ceremony we do. And that kind of, kind of you know, place it at the Parvati. Okay, then I'm kind of happy. That's the kind of gist of the story. But the main thing to take from stories is, is the allegoric meaning, not the literal story. The idea that how Ganesh defended the honor of his mother, said that nobody disturbed me. Eventually what happened afterwards, all these are the kind of key messages that if you have the strength of your mother behind you, you get really immense strength. That's the idea of the Ganesh court. He was fighting for you know, his mother. So the strength is immense. So these are the kind of key messages you take. Don't have a story literally, but the you know, allegory is the more important part. That's the main story about Ganesh. But of course, after the disciples made the Ganesh to be worshipped, then he became very popular. Now, as you know, everywhere you go, you go to uh, any temple, you see Ganesh and Hanuman usually first, right? So it's given this beautiful place. But you know, for Hindus, the thing is that because we see divinity in everything, it's not a problem for us to have a, uh, you know, somebody with an uh, elephant head is absolutely fine. It's for us, all things are divine and living. We have no problem. So in that sense, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Asita? Uh, yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. I think we have to be very careful because in Hinduism, we've got so many colorful stories and it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that they are literally true. We have to understand that they are not literally true. As Vijay Bhai said, there's an allegorical meaning behind it. So you have to look at the deeper meaning behind these stories and why they were sort of created in this particular way, what message they are trying to present. So we can't go too literally. I think last week we were talking about what happened to the poor elephant. <laughs> um, so it, it's a story. So please understand it for what it is. And I think we have to make sure we keep that distinction between uh, the philosophy of Hinduism, which is the Vedas and Upanishads, and the colorful stories. The colorful stories really do serve a purpose because they are the thing which attracts us towards the idea of religion and spirituality as a child, as a young person. We think, oh, wow, look at these beautiful stories. And you kind of get drawn to the idea of spirituality. But as you sort of grow and mature, you start understanding them for what they are and you start to graduate on away from these stories to the deeper philosophy of Hinduism, the Vedas and Upanishads, and even the more recent prophets, that's the best place to go, who are able to express their spiritual experiences in English. Um, so we've got a lot of resources within Hinduism um, and whatever place you are in your spiritual journey, there is something there for you. That's wonderful to hear, Asita Ben. So Kartik Sarma is saying Ganesh is a form which represents astasiddhis of human consciousness. 
Would you agree with that? Is that right? Is that something you would agree with? Uh, Astas, Ganesh representing Astasi days of human consciousness. Sita Ben? Uh, I'm not too, but Abhijay, do you have any questions? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, Ashtasi, these are the strengths we have, like having is sharing, caring, love, all this. In that sense, yes, because Ganesh is all this stuff. I don't know all these, these but there are eight kind of main strengths. I think love, compassion, happiness, you know, auspiciousness. These are all Siddhis in that sense, which manifest from Ganesh. So in that sense, yes, I would say that it's true, that they, they represent the form of Ganesh, absolutely. That's all I can add to that. There's, yeah, Ganesh I is think, actually uh, that in that sense, eight, yeah. Ashta Siddhis come from yoga literature as well, which uh, give you kind of, if you have those, you can become really small, really big and all that. Oh, that as well. Yeah, great. I know heavy, all the light. Yes. That's, that's also say that. Yes, Ganesh is again, all that stuff as well. So all these, you know, growing big is strength, right? Going so small is compassion, humility. So in that, that is all linked together. There, yeah, there's a, there's a very big chart. On, I think I've seen it long time ago, but... As a very big chart, we experience all these connections, yes. So I think you can see Ganesh like that. I mean, old ladies have this kind of, you know, um, connections linked to this kind of uh, human, uh, you know, uh, characteristics. So Ganesh is like that as well, yeah. All right. Okay. So if we're looking at Ganesh's story, there is two animals that are very popular. And the one is um, the mousy and the second is the elephant because of elephant head. And in uh, Siva's story comes uh, snake because Siva wraps this uh, cobra around his neck. How are these animals important? And some of these, uh, some people actually, you know, say we shouldn't be harming these animals. And there are temples dedicated uh, in some places to mouse and uh, even the, um, I think the Nagadevta. How how do we explain this, uh, Vijay Bhai? What's going uh, on? I, I think as we covered earlier, see for us, all these living things are divine and they all have an Atman imbibed into them. So it's not unusual, I mean, to have all these different animals linked to the deities. I think it's very beautiful because it actually divinifies them. It's not just a mere mouse or just a mere, you know, a snake. I know that, for example, a snake is, when I was growing up in Kenya, I know that Snake was seen as the evil, I don't know, form of Satan or something. And quite often there will see people get angry and kill it, right? And I've seen it myself. It's really depressing to see that. But the thing is, is that when you divinify that, I mean, Shiva is also known in the bull, right? And Shiva is known as Pashupati Nath. There's a very famous uh, uh, motif in, in from Indus Valley civilization, which is a form of Shiva with, a, I think, an animal head with horns and animals everywhere and sitting in a military posture. And it's so beautiful to see the deity that all the animals linked to it. I guess it, it, gives, it really feels nice to see that all animals, all life, you know, it, the, the way you see the world totally changes when you see that. And I think that the fact that we have animals actually with deities reflects that idea. And I think it's very beautiful. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, mouse is, of course, very strange with Ganesh. How does he ride a mouse? I have no idea. But <laughs> I guess the mouse really goes big or he becomes really small. But, uh, you know, that's... That's all part of, as Sita mentioned, our Puranic story, which makes it really colorful and lively, brings Hinduism alive. I mean, as, as Jay Bai mentioned quite often, as young children, the reason why we come to Hinduism because these stories is what really pulls us, right, eventually. So that's also part of, you know, how Hinduism is, Sita. Yeah, I mean, I think because, um, well, the whole Shiva tradition is very sort of egalitarian and it promotes this idea of egalitarianism across different kinds of, you know, right, uh, you know, different kinds of people, different animals and all of that. And I think possibly um, the reason why, you know, we've got the elephant and the mouse is one is very big and one is very small. So it's saying, I guess, maybe symbolically in the eyes of God, they are all, you know, seen as equally divine. It doesn't matter your size, that kind of thing. Um, but the, this is the thing. There's all sorts of interpretations you can you can add to it. Um, but the beautiful thing, as Vijay Bhai said, is this idea that every animal, every person, every human being is seen as divine um, in the eyes of God. So um, that's really what all of these animal features and animals are sort of included in all the images of deities is really representing. And people often outside of Hinduism, they see it as 
oh, what a weird religion, the fact that you're inc incorporating animal heads and animals into the images of gods and goddesses. But actually, it's one of our strengths because we are saying that the animal kingdom is equally divine as well. We are elevating it to the level of divinity. All of us are divine and it's our duty and responsibility as human beings to make sure we care for the living kingdom, including all animals. So true. Yes, uh, I agree with you completely there, Sita, when we should be caring for the whole of uh, animal kingdom. Uh, next question is, um, we have a viewer saying, uh, you know, um, we have a video uh, which compares uh, Seva with Vishnu and it's ongoing comments on it. Uh, some people love Seva and say Seva is the best uh, and some people will say no Vishnu is uh, as per Bhagavatam is the best and this sort of thing keep on going on that uh, and uh, you know some viewers complain that uh, 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 some prada in Hinduism actually just promotes uh, Krishna uh, as the god and uh, really puts down the other gods. How, how do we deal with this? Um, also, if you want to you know, experience a particular deity, you need to focus on one. So do, do you need to put down others or what, what should one do? How should one progress spiritually? Sita Ven. Uh, yeah, I mean, the wonderful thing about Hinduism, as we've said many, many times, is it's incredibly pluralistic by nature. So we are not out to sort of demean other sects or other ways of thinking about God. And actually, the vast majority of Hindus, well, from, from my, my experience anyway, do not sort of go out there and create conflict between people of other sort of, you know, other pathways, for example. So if you go into any Hindu household, if you go into the mandir, you will see a whole collection <laughs> of all these gods and goddesses. You've got, you know, Vishnu sitting right next to Ganesh and you've got Mother Goddess and you've got Krishna and they're all sitting together nicely. And because every member of the family may be drawn to a particular deity like Ganesh or Shiva or Mother Goddess or whoever it is, and you don't get this infighting in a family that my one is better, my one is better. So I think compared to, you know, other sort of parts of the world I think we're quite sort of open in the sense that we don't go out and physically go and have a fight with anybody who <laughs> believes in something else to us because that's the essence of Hinduism is that whatever path you are on it will take you to the same destination so what is the point in fighting because they all lead to the same point all of us are individuals we have our own personalities we're all starting from a different place on our journey and the whole point is that we are going to come together. The more you focus on your path, just focus on your path. Don't go out there and criticize others. It, it sounds completely different or contradictory to yours. Doesn't matter. Just focus on your path. And as you make your progress, you will start to feel that natural affinity with those who are on a seemingly very opposite or very different path. And that's the beauty of Hinduism. It's so inherent in our tradition and it's possibly you know, the reason why Hinduism has really stood the test of time. We've had so many invaders, we've had so many people trying to convert us, but Hinduism is still there as one of the most ancient religions in the world because we are incredibly tolerant. We absorb and assimilate and integrate. Uh, for example, we don't go out there and start a fight with Buddhists because Buddhism came from India, or we don't go out there and start a fight with the Jain tradition. We don't do stuff like that. It's not in our nature to go and fight and cause conflict with those who have a different spiritual outlook to ourselves. Uh, Vijay Pai? I see that very nicely put. I agree, totally agree with what you just said. Yeah, I think one thing Manish Bhai mentioned that I remember Jay Bhai, even when we used to talk, give classes in, in, you know, in Hinduism, if you ever made a mistake of promoting Hinduism by stepping on others, you would really be very strict with us. I remember that. Never step on other faiths just to promote yourself. And I think the one thing we have to be very careful is that if I don't understand the tradition, like say, for example, you got a tradition of uh, somebody believing in, you know, I don't know, some forest deities for generations. When you're interacting with a deity for, for generations and you revere that and you live in that kind of environment, how can I even begin to imagine how they think? I can't. It's just not in me because I'm, I'm an urban person, right? I follow Sri Krishna. There is no way I would even, even come close to see, understand how they think. So how can I just make a judgment immediately? Oh, I should, they are bad, they should be stepped down. 
No, it doesn't work like that. That's just really wrong. And that's what I, that's also, you know, that's something you're very careful about. If somebody is a Shiva tradition and I'm strict Shiva Vishnu, the fact that Shiva tradition has been going through the generations, geographical reasons, traditional reasons, ancestral reasons, the whole ethos of understanding Shiva is so different. I can't even comprehend, right? Because you're all individuals. How can I judge that person? It's totally wrong. I can't even begin to think, right? So the best is that the deity of your choice, use that deity and try and follow that deity in the best way you can and make the progress. And accept that everybody else has their own historical background, spiritual background, also same, you know, aptitude and age makes a difference. And they will follow their own paths. And that's absolutely fine. So I think we have to be very careful the, not to, I've seen this, I won't name names, but I've seen some, some products have actually totally ignored other <laughs> deities and they say, okay, this is the only one. I've also been told that if you follow your deity, you'd have to be reborn again in our sampradaya, and then you achieve. I said, you know, what is that supposed to mean? But one thing, one thing interesting I must mention is, if you look at all the ancient works, like Tulsi Ramayana, for example, notice how every time he starts off in the first sentence sloka, he always praises Ganesh, Shiva. So all the ancient kind of you know great bards of India, they have always made sure that we remain part of the overall fold of Hinduism and not break out. You'd be surprised, even in my own Swami and Sampradaya faith, we have been asked to celebrate Ganesh Chaturthi, Shivratri, Surya, we should also worship Surya, also, you know, Parvati. So actually, we've been asked to, we've been asked to, discuss, we've asked to worship them as well. So in effect, the idea is to be careful that you can worship what date you want, but also accept that the other pathways. And that's why I really love Ramakrishna Paramahansa. He actually showed this, you know, firsthand. Don't try and play these games of, you know, mine is best, yours is mm, so, so. No, no. They all can do. I mean, that's the interesting thing about Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Notice what I just mentioned now. You know, when he said, when he was practicing the idea of, say, worshiping Krishna with Gopi Bhav, he actually became that. Because, you know, it's no point saying, uh, he does it, uh, I, can, I can do it. You have to think like that person who does Gopi Bhav, right? And he did that, right? Put on a sari, whatever. It may sound silly to us, but think about it. If you want to worship Krishna in a particular way or go in a particular way, you have to be that person thinking that form. As I was mentioned, that's why everybody thinks differently and they'll see go differently. And I think that's why it's, it's so endearing to hear Ramakrishna from not only just saying, I didn't just say I have worship going all different forms. He actually changed his attitude, changed his form, changed his understanding, changed his thought process. And then he showed us the proof. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Yeah. That is wonderful answer, Vijay Vaisita. I mean, that's very well uh, explained. Uh, I hope uh, our viewers uh, uh, enjoy that uh, and uh, got their answers they wanted uh, to the question. Uh, we take a next question from um, Donald Trump, who is a regular viewer. He's saying, every day is like a curse for me. I'm very lonely. What should I do? Any advice, Vijay Bhai? I think a lot of us actually go through this kind of phases. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's once I read a book called The Walden by, you know, Henry David Thoreau. You know, he spent a lot of years in the forest on his own. And I was wondering, how did he do that on his own? And he actually, with the trees and the forest, he so much enjoyed that. And he would interview the humans. So I'm not saying that. But what I would say is try and little positive things day by day. Go out in the trees, forest, see divinity everywhere. Slowly, slowly, you'll feel better. I know quite, quite often people who are introverts have very difficulty interacting with people. But in a way, interacting with people also is very good for health. Uh, see, as mentioned a while back, relationships are very, very powerful. But if you do not try and see divinity everywhere else, remember, it doesn't matter that, uh, it doesn't matter if you don't do really big things. Even doing small things, right? It's a very uh, important. If you help a little, you know, bird and feed him a seed, that also is, you should really be proud of yourself, doing even small things. Don't feel like life is a curse because with the life we have, you can do so many beautiful, albeit very small things, you can do so many beautiful things. And start changing your life, like I guess. Start doing small, small good things. If not to fellow human beings, to animals, to nature, you know, to trees or something. And then slowly to develop love again, it come back. But it is a tough thing, depending on, I, I can't judge, of course. I don't know how the challenges you face in life, your circumstances which have kind of molded you. But the best is to build up slowly and, and try and start with small, small good things. And that's why I always remember, you know, Vivekananda, live for others 
and live for other things like nature. If you do that, eventually you will, you will enjoy that. You will feel the joy of doing things for others. Sita? Uh, yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. So obviously thinking about the other is always so much, you know, it gives you so much fulfillment and satisfaction. But I think also we have to remember that life is incredibly hard for everyone. It's inevitable for all of us to go through all kinds of suffering in this world. And that's why we're, we're very lucky that we've got this spiritual handle that we can use to help us out um, in very, very difficult times. So the thing is, you have to sort of look inward and reflect and think, what is what is the right thing for me to do for my own spiritual journey because only you can really decide that in hinduism we're incredibly lucky we've got so many different ways of making spiritual progress and you have to choose for yourself you can't ask somebody else you have to do it yourself is it that you love to think of god as a personality if so then develop a great relationship of love with that form of god if it involves you like you like to think of everyone as being divine then try and do something in the community as Vijay Bhai was saying try and do some good uh, maybe go to do some charitable work maybe um, do something out there for somebody else or for for the animal kingdom as Vijay Bhai say just go and feed a bird it's beautiful so all of these things can also help you on your spiritual journey and um, every day try and take a little time to reflect just reflect on your journey where you are at that point so have a little pause in your day to sort of reflect and that will hopefully give you that strength to carry on and overcome the obstacles we're talking about Ganesh maybe Ganesh is your chosen path so just follow um, your heart and do what is right for your spiritual progress and hopefully you can come out of this difficult period all of us go through difficult periods so hopefully it'll get better as things move on. That is wonderful answer Sita Ben Vijay Bhai. Uh... Donald Trump, uh, we hope this helps and uh, let us know. Uh, do stay in touch. Uh, it's good to have you in the, our group. We take next question from Alicia Silva. She's saying, if I understand correctly, Krishna is not affected by Maya. Can you please explain during the war when Krishna picked up a wheel, was he pretending to be angry? Yeah, you, you know the story, Vijay Bhai, that uh, Krishna vowed to not pick up a weapon during the Mahabharata war. Mm -hmm. And then Bhishma fought so valiantly, he, uh, Krishna was compelled to pick up this wheel and really aim towards Bhishma, where Bhishma kneeled down and bowed down to Krishna and said, go and finish it. <laughs> so what's going on in this story, uh, Vijay Bhai? It's a beautiful story. I mean, he, the thing is, that too is Maya. The fact that he picks that wheel up and, you know, Bhishma was so desperate to see Krishna in, in, a, in that kind of form so he could bow to him. So I want to see Krishna in his warrior form. He was so determined to see it, right? He was, how can I get Krishna to be in warrior form? And Krishna had no choice but to bless him with what he wanted to see. So in effect, Krishna said, look, I will show you. In that focus, I will show you that form. And if you look at the story, Vishma was so happy. Oh, Krishna, thank God I saw you in this beautiful form, in a form of you know, supreme energy and strength. He was so desperate to see that. He goes, how did they get out of Krishna? So Krishna, of course, existed for a long, long time. Eventually, he had to bless him by giving him what he wanted to see, in a way. So I think the Krishna story is really amazing. I mean, that's not the only case. There's so many different kinds of issues, you see. Like, like you know, when he went to meet Duryodhan, they would come to my house and eat all these sweets and whatever. He goes, no, no. I'm going to eat, you know, this uh, dry bread, you know, what do you call this, rotlo and bhaji, and he went to Vidur's house, right? That all is Maya in a way. But there's a very subtle message behind it. What Krishna is doing, in a way, is, is satisfying his best devotees. What are the best, the best he was going to see, he will give it to them. So Vidur wanted him to come to his house, he went there. Arjun said, you know, I want you, and it's close that, you know, he became a sarthi. So in a way, in many ways, Krishna has no choice if his loving devotees want to do something, he's actually bound by this. He will do it. So that is, I think, also that is part of Maya. So don't see, so always detect it from Maya. When Krishna does it, that, it, that too itself is Maya. It's not Krishna doing it. It's part of realm of Maya. So keep it like that. So that, then you are safe. Otherwise, because Krishna's story is very complicated. The, the India thing, thing about Krishna is this, that so many things he does are part of our characters. Have you noticed? Like we would prefer somebody who is humble and poor and go at his house and eat. 
you prefer somebody you know if somebody is something somebody who loves love you so you prefer to help him out or even bend the rules to help our devotees so krishna in essence very endearing as sita uh, yeah it, it's really beautiful because at the heart of all of this action is this idea that actually it's all you know it's not really as it seems really so you have the thing is you are in maya we understand that we are all in maya um and we understand theoretically at least that everything is not as it seems but that doesn't mean that we stop acting and it, it doesn't mean that we stop performing our duties and doing our our role basically um and it really reminds me very much of the example that shri ramakrishna gave so he t- uses the example of a nanny who is looking after children in somebody else's house so she's doing all her duties looking after the children of somebody else but her attention and her mind is always back home to her own children so that's how we should sort of live in the world is that we carry on doing our duties but our heart our mind is dedicated to our home which is essentially god so because we we understand that everything is an appearance in that sense we still it doesn't mean we just sit still and don't do anything we have to continue acting we have to continue doing our duties but keep our hearts and minds directed towards god as much as we can that's wonderful to hear very well answered vijay bhai must say that was uh, wonderful to hear uh, lovely answer there sita ben vijay bhai uh we take um, next question uh, i'm going to roll i'm going to roll in two three questions into one uh because i think uh, okay so harsh gupta saying sivkar bab ki tal pade his works and blueprints were stolen by britishers and given to right brothers that's one question uh, say something about that second question uh, <clears throat> sanchit hanichal is saying uh, i want to learn about uh, ancient knowledge about uh, weapons uh, shastra vidya where where do i get the books from do we have uh, any any information on such topics uh, vijay bhai okay i think the okay first question about this uh, shivkar bapuji talpade that is not really i think linked to his message but i can't remember much now but i know that from maharashtra is from maharashtra or mumbai or somewhere i know that he was very famous in doing art and craft very clever innovative person and there's a there's a lot of people who believe that he actually had the first blueprint of building you know aircraft whatever and then some people say it was stolen and given right but there's person like there's no evidence that that they that to link the link together that is given right i'm not sure of that but it is true that he did a lot of work in that area and so i can add to that i don't know more about that so i'm not an expert i i so, did read up i did read up on this one okay okay then mr bakeni explain yeah it is true he was in that famous arts uh, arts uh, place can he used the blueprints from one of the old uh, you know ancient texts uh, so aeronautical engineer kind of, kind of thing but and it was using i think mercury or something for for fuel uh, but there is no documented evidence that uh, a successful flight took place it did lift off for a little bit but it then crashed and then there was no uh, evidence they said some maharaja was supposed to view it but there was nowhere is uh, documented uh and so it's hard to tell so sorry what second question manish bhai uh, just remind me again okay the question from sanchit was he wants to learn about uh, ancient shastra vidya the uh, of weapons <laughs> okay there is actually a, a, a scripture that called upavedas there's four upaveda scriptures you can read them if you want i haven't read them but apart from the vedas there's you know some gandharva shastras for dancing is one called dhanur i think dhanur shastra i think i can't remember the name exact name then there is arth shastra for economics so there is one shastra uh, i'll try and get the name just now i can't remember it but there is actually a upaveda is called upaveda which talks about dhanur vidya so there is one by the way i have already so i can't tell you more than that sorry <laughs> yeah okay that's all i can add to sita i don't know if you add more than that no. okay uh, next question uh, ian pride you is similar uh, topic is uh, saying does Does the team have an example in Hindu scripture where the text contained a scientific or mathematical truth before it was revealed? Do we know of any such things? Do we look at the scripture scientifically and says here it is something 
before the science class, we we were we knew this stuff. Uh, Vijay, bhai, again over to you. Uh, okay, all I can say is that one thing to keep in mind. This is very important. Is that the Indic acharyas never made distinction between the spiritual and the science. I'll be honest with you, because if you look at all the ancient gurukuls, the two of them is one. Even science was seen as a spiritual endeavor. If you look at Arya Bhat, I think Bhattatya works. Arya Bhat's work, when he talks about numbers, you know, all these prime numbers, everything, he doesn't talk of them as uh, science. He talks of them as spiritual. So no distinction was made, but there are very many scriptures. I mean, even I think even Ramanuja. If you look at Ramanuja, you know the guy who discovered who was studying here. The guy was famous for the infinite number series and all that kind of stuff. And Ramanuja was also very famous for the prime number theories, which is which is interesting because, you know, if I say to you, uh, give me a number, prime numbers between before ten is four, right? You know, two, three, I think five and seven. Before twenty is four. What if you give a number like a million? Give me all the prime numbers, number before a million. You wouldn't, can't read in your head, but actually Ramanujan could read mathematically. He saw the mathematical equation, but a huge number, number of prime numbers in that number. But even when you asked him, he goes, how did you find this out? He goes, you know, God has told me, Mother God has told me, right? So even he never distinguished because that's why it's very hard for the Western to understand this. Even if you look at Bhaskar Acharya, you know, who did a lot of work in quadratic equations, they saw their spiritual. So these are ancient works. Even in the Vedic scriptures, a lot of stuff, Vedic mathematics, all this over here is doing mathematics in a different way, but it's a spiritual endeavor. Same with sports. Dhanur video talk about weapons. The old spiritual endeavors, no distinction is made. In effect, you can make spiritual progress in all these fields. As Sita keeps on reminding all the time, spiritually can be a kind of uh, endeavor can be approached in many different ways, not just one way, like a dance, music, art, mathematics, science. And that's why these Acharyas of India never made distinction. It's very difficult for the Westerners to understand it because they have a clear distinction. This is God stuff, you know, Bible. This is science. They don't touch and don't touch. Not for Hinduism. So keep that in mind. So I think there are many, many books, like old books. But of course, as time goes by, we learn new things and modern Acharyas will make it in a better format. And if you look at all these books of, you know, mathematics or science or even geography, Itihas, the great, great... Um, there is something I must mention. There's a very uh, famous series called the, it's called the Upanishad Ganga series. It comes on YouTube. There's about 72 of those series. And they talk about these great Acharyas. Please read that. Uh, watch the series. It's done by, I think, Chatur Gupta uh, Tvivedi. He's done that. Tvivedi, he's done that series. And you see all the different Acharyas and the great contributions they made to science, mathematics, geography, and how they tackle that as, as a spiritual endeavor then you might get the idea of how that uh, kind of works. Yeah, it's a very big topic, but I'll stop here. Uh, Sita, anything to add? Uh, yeah, actually, this idea, um, you know, through this idea of introspection, uh, there's a great deal of insights that we have gained um, on the Indian subcontinent, which really resonate greatly with science. And the thing that pops into my head straight away is what Dad's passion and heart was into is this idea of quantum because at the heart of you know the Vedas and Upanishads is this idea that everything is Brahman everything is divine everything is spirit and you know it's actually non-material the universe is not made out of matter and small bricks and all of that it's actually non-material and it's something that you know that was discarded for so many centuries upon centuries especially in the west that oh you know that's that's just airy fairy spiritual stuff and actually, we thought for so long that, you know, it's atoms which are the building blocks of the universe. But very recently, uh, with the discovery of quantum, obviously, um, we've discovered that the basis of everything is actually non-material. So I find it absolutely mind blowing that in ancient India, without all of this incredible gadgets and gizmos and all of this external research that has been done to prove it in Sort of physical sciences, the fact that in ancient India we were able to discover that same reality through the process of meditation and introspection is absolutely mind blowing. That's wonderful to hear, Sita and Vijay. Bhai. Uh, very well answered, I think. Uh, next, uh, we take a last question for the day and uh, an interesting one from Vedant Vittal Rao Descartes. He's, he's asking, who is a supreme personality? Sita? Sita, wish. 
um, Brahman spirit is everything and everyone and it's just manifesting as everything. And um, if you sort of think of it, um, I remember my dad loved this particular bhajan, uh, Mother and Mother and everything is divine, everything is spirit. So <clears throat> when you have that incredible spiritual experience, whatever path you have taken to get there, whether it's through love of Ganesh or Krishna or whoever it is, or through the Advait tradition where you see everyone and everything is divine. The fact that it's all the same is, is absolutely beautiful. That same divinity is behind this seemingly crass, materialistic, uh, muddy, dirty world that we're living in. And you sometimes you look at everything and you're like, you know, you go to like all these dumpy areas and you're like, really, is this all meant to be divine? <laughs> but actually it is. And when you have that spiritual experience, everything looks beautiful. It looks incredibly sweet and divine. Um, so I think it just shows that what we see and experience in our everyday life is, is not really how things actually are. And it's a case of going on on our spiritual journey and discovering that everything is sweet everything is divine no matter what your <laughs> journey is however you've got there you will get there um, and that's really evident through we've said many times the personality of Sri Ramakrishna because without having that the one person to say actually these all lead to the same place how do we know that they all get to the same place through an experiential level he has actually displayed that you can because without that how do we know so that's the beauty of it they all do and we've got this dynamic personality who needs to be sort of shone shine a beacon around the world that actually all of these paths lead to the same divinity uh Vijay Bhai? I think Sita has covered it so well. Nothing more to add. All I will say is that listen to that bhajan by Valmacharya. Adharam Madhuram is very beautiful. I like the one sung by Judge, uh, Judge, no, Pandi Jashraj. That's a very, but it's very nice variant. Uh, please listen to that bhajan. It's, it's beautiful. That's just like I said. Uh, over to you. Fantastic. What a, an interesting session we've had today. And I, I've got to say, you know, congratulations to the community we've got at hand. They've had uh, we've had a whole new batch of new people on today, some of them who've just been to our session for the very first time. So welcome to you all. Please do join us every Saturday at 2 o'clock UK time, and you can catch us on YouTube or Facebook, like I said. Uh, Manish Pai, Sita Ben, and Vijay Bhai, thank you so much for sharing uh, you know, all the information about the questions. I know we put you on the spot at times, uh, but... I just wanted to share for those of you who are new to the broadcast, you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, we are trying to grow the channel there as well. So uh, recently we reached 40,000 and it's growing very nicely. But you can catch us live on Twitter now. You can also catch us live on the Hindu Academy Facebook page. There we are. And <clears throat> on YouTube, we've hit a very nice figure of 111,000 subscribers. But my goal, as you can see here, is to get to 10 million views very soon. So that can only happen with your help. So if you're watching us for the very first time, please take a second to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification because we still have a lot of material that has never been publicly aired before. And we do share it on a regular basis. We have new content for JBI coming out on our YouTube channel on a regular basis, so you don't want to miss that, and your support would be highly appreciated. A few of you asked about the Basics of Hinduism course. I have shared the link in the comments area on, uh, on the channels, uh, and this course currently has over 8,000 students, so feel free to please um, sign up for it. It will give you a really good foundation for Hinduism in the modern era. This is our main website, hindu-academy.com. And uh, over here, you can download the e-learning books, which are here. Please use this links here because you can get the PDF straight from our Google Drive uh, folder. And you can also sign up for the e-learning course from here. And if there is any technical difficulties, please feel free to reach out to me. The, the, those are my contact details there. And I'll be happy to support you. For the very end, I'd like to finish with a quote. Now, normally we do finish with a quote from Swami Vivekanand. I thought I'll vary it up for today. Seeing that we are talking about Ganesh Chaturthi. And so just wanted to say that 
May Lord Ganesha remove all your obstacles and pave your way towards happiness and prosperity. Happy Ganesh Chaturthi from the team here at Hindu Academy. And uh, I'll bring my team back on. Here we go. And we will look forward to seeing you at 2 o'clock next week on Saturday as always. Bye-bye for now. Thank you and have a great day.